ஹாய் போவான் வணக்கம் அஸ்லாம் வலைக்கம் அண்ட் குட் ஈவினிங் வெல்கம் டு த லான்ச் ஆஃப் த பப்ளிகேஷன் ஸ்ரீலங்கா அண்ட் த யுனைடட் நேஷன்ஸ் ரிலேஷன்ஸ் வித் த யூஎன் ஜென்ரல் அசம்பிளி த ஃபஸ்ட் வால்யூம் ஆஃப் த பப்ளிகேஷன் இஸ் பீயிங் லான்ச் டு மார்க் த சிக்ஸ்டி ஃபிஃப்த் அனிவர்சரி ஆஃப் ஸ்ரீலங்காஸ் அட்மிஷன் டு த யுனைடட் நேஷன்ஸ் திஸ் இயர் ஆல்சோ மார்க்ஸ் த செவன்டி ஃபிஃப்த் அனிவர்சரி சின்ஸ் த எஸ்டாப்ளிஷ்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் த யுனைடட் நேஷன்ஸ் அண்ட் த செஞ்சுரி ஆஃப் மல்டிலெக்ட்ரலிசம் சின்ஸ் த ஃபவுண்டிங் ஆஃப் த லீக் ஆஃப் நேஷன் to commence proceedings let us pay our respect love and gratitude to mother lanka by rising for the national anthem of the democratic socialist republic of sri lanka lighting the ceremonial oil lamp and dispersing the darkness with light in our culture symbolizes the dispelling of ignorance through knowledge we take great pleasure in inviting the guests on stage to light the lamp mrs evet cook
Senior Professor Naini Melagoda, Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies of the University of Colombo. Professor Meritus Amal Jayawardena, Senior Professor, General Sir John Kothalavala Defence University. Dr. Chanaka Talpaheva, Head UN Habitat in Sri Lanka. His Excellency Eric Lavartu, Ambassador of France in Sri Lanka. Her Excellency Chulamani Chatsuan, Ambassador of Thailand in Sri Lanka. Ambassador Shenuka Seneviratna, former permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the UN and former Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Ambassador A.M.J. Sadiq, Additional Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ms. Ritsunakan, Head of UNFPA.
மிஸ்டர் ராஜன் ஆசீர்வாதம் டாக்டர் பாலித அபயகோன் பிரசிடென்ட் ஸ்ரீலங்கா மெடிக்கல் அசோசியேஷன் Mr. Sunil Disanayaka, Director and Chief Executive of the Bandaranayaka National Memorial Foundation. Dr. Alan Lodewijk. டாக்டர் ஷாமில் அப்பா துரை டாக்டர் ருமால் குணராத்ன மிஸ்டர் இந்து தர்மசேன மிஸ் குமுது முனசிங்க Mr. George Cook. Thank you. The journey in the United Nations began in 1948 with the contribution of many Sri Lankans. May we kindly request you to strive for a minute of silence in memory of those who contributed and are not with us today.
to speak a few words of welcome, may I invite the editor of the publication, George Cook, to the podium. Let knowledge grow from more to more, but more of reverence in us dwell, that mind and soul, according well, may make one music as before. Lord Tennyson, in his epic rendition of faith, meaning, and nature, draws the reader through his magnum opus, In Memoriam, highlighting struggles. Reflection upon that which has been is tinged with sadness, Yet hope remains at the heart, and it is to return to that past that he yearns, but it focuses mainly on a struggle. Excellencies, senior academics, distinguished invitees, family and friends, the world, the country, the self, continue to battle with struggles. The world has experienced wars, tension, and unrest over the centuries. Our country has gone through varied moments in her history, with contemporary times seeing a conflict with terrorism, more recently extremism, and now a health security situation. As individuals, life in its entirety sees moments of joy and those of sadness. We have been surrounded by stories of doom and gloom throughout this year. My mother is with us this evening. As a family, we too faced moments of trial, especially with my father passing away in May this year. What remains are reflections of the past, and this is why the past is so important for the present and essentially for the future. This is so for the world, the country, and the self. The publication being launched this evening attempts to draw you into that past to reminisce that which occurred, experience the trials and tribulations, as well as the triumphs that this country has faced. Further, it invites you to reflect upon people and personalities and the impact they have made on the journey of this country in the multilateral sphere. Many are not with us, and that was why I felt it appropriate to remember them this evening. They started a journey which we continue to traverse to date. We have much to learn from their successes and failures, making history an integral part of the learning process. When we comprehend the past, we understand the present, and we can plan for the future. The personalities in the short video you just watched were drawn from a diversity of communities that make up the matrix of this beautiful island we call home. When I look out at this gathering this evening, I see a diversity of communities that make the matrix of this beautiful island we call home. The team helping me this evening, and you'll see them in the course of the evening uh, with various tasks that they have been entrusted with, are drawn from the diversity of communities in this country and form the matrix of this beautiful island we call home. The success of diversity and its incorporation is one of the first lessons we learn from history. In this case, the journey of Sri Lanka in the UN, a lesson we would all do well to heed. Foreign policy, its formulation and implementation has remained a critical factor for all countries. Our island nation has interacted over centuries with the world at large and has played a very important role and been an important node for empires and roots. Its relevance has been highlighted over and over again and yet we need to be mindful that we are part of an international system and not the most exclusive cog in the wheel. The speeches made at the UN serve as an ideal barometer to assess the role this country has played in the largest multilateral forum. The strides we have taken and stances we have adopted reflect a past that is rich, rich in involvement and rich in commitment. Dr. Vernon L.B. Mendes, a personal mentor, in reflecting at the 50th anniversary of the United Nations in Colombo, said, we must be thankful to the United Nations for our very existence. However difficult it was, and however much the tensions and anxieties, 
It has brought us through the valley of the shadow of death of 50 years of living in the shadow of nuclear destruction. It has averted something which would have meant the annihilation of the human race. For that, we have to be thankful to the United Nations. It did so through the pursuit of diplomacy, through perseverance, and the refusal to accept defeat. There must have been more than one occasion when life was on a knife edge, when we were at the edge of the precipice, but yet we survived." Unquote. Multilateralism is proving continuously to be an important recourse in international affairs as countries engage in a deeper and wider context than ever before. Sri Lanka has much to contribute and equally to gain through these platforms of interaction. It is believed that through clear reflection on that which has been, careful comprehension of that which is, and proper preparation for that which will be, Sri Lanka will be able to proceed well into the future. This publication, it is hoped, will encourage deeper research in Sri Lanka's foreign policy and multilateralism and is a humble contribution to that study. I'm going to break with tradition this evening in welcoming you and also thanking you in the same speech. I wish to take this opportunity to express my sincerest appreciation to all of you for your presence here this evening. It is this encouragement that you have given me which is truly pivotal to the step that is being taken today. To the four distinguished personalities on my left, I owe a huge debt of gratitude. They accepted my requests, consented to support this endeavor in various ways, and graced this occasion this evening. I'm very thankful to them. Thank you, Your Excellencies, the Ambassador of Thailand, the Ambassador of France, members of the Diplomatic Corps. Your presence means a lot to me. When I look at the two ambassadors, especially, your countries are ones which I have had wonderful memories with and continue to engage with. Thank you to the representatives of the United Nations system. Thank you to Her Excellency Ambassador Kathleen Bogier, the chairperson of the third committee, who, a true friend of Sri Lanka, who sent a special message for this publication. To the three academics who have sent video messages for this launch, Professor Sharad Soni, Vera Elkuri Lakoy, and Dr. Titipol Pakdivanich, three amazing people I have met in the sphere of academia. Thank you, Mr. Sunil Disanayaka, for making arrangements with the chairperson for the granting of this venue for this event, and to all distinguished invitees for gracing this occasion. To my friends and my students, who are also my friends, who stick with me through thick and thin, um, thank you to each and every one of you. To the team helping me this evening who have gone the extra mile to support this venture. And so I shall give way to the rest of the program this evening. But let me say that your coming here, despite a pandemic, is extremely encouraging. Amidst the gloom around us, we still realize that 2020 is a significant year. Let us yield to the sentiments of Lord Tennyson. Let knowledge grow from more to more but more of reverence in us dwell, that mind and soul, according well, may make one music as before. Thank you. Permit me to introduce our keynote speaker this evening. He obtained his PhD in Politics and International Studies from the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. During his doctoral studies, he was awarded the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust Scholarship, Developing World Education Fund Scholarship, and Smuts Scholarship in Commonwealth Studies. He obtained his MPhil in Politics and International Studies from the University of Cambridge and was a recipient of the British Chevening Scholarship, while his MA in IR, MBA, and BSc degrees are from the University of Colombo. He has also completed his postgraduate diploma in marketing and is an attorney at law. He is a visiting lecturer at University of Colombo, University of Kalania, American National College, Bandaranaik International Diplomatic Training Institute, and Bandaranaik Center for International Studies followed by Command and Staff College, Sapugaskandar. As an outstanding sportsman, he captained Sri Lanka in rowing 
and won medals at the South Asian Games and currently holds two Sri Lanka records. An officer of the Sri Lanka Foreign Service, wherein he came first in the country at the SLFS recruitment examination, he has served in the Sri Lanka missions in New York, the Maldives, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Currently, he is serving as the head of agency and country program, manager of United Nations Human Settlement Program, also known as UN Habitat, in Sri Lanka and the Maldives. He has numerous publications and academic papers to his name. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Chanaka Thakpaheva uh, for the keynote address. This is Evert Cook, Madam, Emeritus Professor Amal Javadana, Sir, Senior Professor Madam Naini Malagoda, Admiral Chanta Kolambagi, and distinguished guest, a very good evening to all of you all. What I'll be discussing is Sri Lanka's foreign policy challenges from ancient to current, some perspectives. Domestic policy can defeat us. Foreign policy can kill us. John F. Kennedy. That encapsulates the importance of foreign policy. What is foreign policy? We can sum it up to say that it is a government strategy in dealing with other countries to promote and to safeguard a country's national interest. In this modern era, we will have to consider relations with multilateral organizations like the United Nations, bilateral organizations, and even international financial institutions. So when our national interests are challenged or compromised, it leads to foreign policy challenges. For the purpose of clarity, during my presentation, I will categorize time periods and the foreign policy challenges faced into three areas. First, the ancient times, where foreign invasions and safeguarding the territory was a main foreign policy challenge. Then, post-independence era, the emerging Cold War rivalry and the development requirements of the country were the main foreign policy challenges. Then the third period is the post-Cold War era, which I would call a transforming world with a multitude of foreign policy challenges. So let's go one by one. The ancient times. Sri Lanka has the distinction of being a distinct sovereign entity for over 2,000 years. We have been ruled over by 189 or above that number kings, and if we Consider the number of kings who have ruled parts of Sri Lanka, the number exceeds 295. Historically, we have excelled in many fields, including relations with other countries, that means international relations. We had good relations with the Roman Empire, Hellenistic Kingdom, Court of Axum in the Horn of Africa, Sassanian Kingdom in Persia, Byzantine Empire, Empire of Sri Vijaya, Kingdom of Siam, India, China, Cambodia, Myanmar, the list goes on. The gamut of international relations we have had is evident by Greek and Roman writings starting from 3rd century BC, where Kaltenis, Strabo, and Pliny has referred to Sri Lanka. Even famous travelers like Fahian, Ibn Battuta, Marco Polo, visited Sri Lanka and wrote extensively about Sri Lanka. And even if you consider the map drawn by Ptolemy in 150 AD, it depicts Sri Lanka as Taprobana. And if you look at carefully the size of Taprobana, it is geographically bigger proportionately than the actual size. Perhaps it is an acknowledgement of the importance attached to Sri Lanka in the Asian world. But I must mention, there are two other theories, that Taproban is actually the island of Sumatra of Indonesia, and the other theory says it is Kalamanta or Borneo Island. 
But the general consensus is it is Sri Lanka. Then if you look at the number of names by which Sri Lanka has been referred to, this year book was published in Singhala. There are close upon 200 names. So then how and why did Sri Lanka make such a huge impact in the ancient world? I can sum it down to two factors. Its location and its treasures. Now if you consider location, there are three vital geographical dimensions. It's contiguity to the Indian subcontinent. It's equidistant position between East Africa and East Asia. And situation astride, the sea lanes linking East and the West. If you look at the treasures, Sri Lanka was well known for its exotic treasures like gems, spices, ivory, not to forget exotic animals like elephants and leopards. It was a famous entrepot and a thriving trading hub. So you can see how we have made the mark. But all these factors, all these factors attracted attention of foreign powers, foreign innovations. And the landmark innovations include Marga of Kalinga in 1215, Chandrabhanu of Ligo in 1247, then Aryan uh, Pandya Nara Chakravarti in the 13th century and Chinese Admiral Zheng He in the 15th century. So when these invasions happen, our, the policy of the kings, what we would call the foreign policy, in the current parlance, was to meet this challenge with a combination of military and diplomacy. So sometimes they fought back the invaders militarily. Sometimes they reached out to rival powers. So that shows there were relationships and emissaries moving around the kingdoms. Then sometimes what they did was to get rid of the invaders and into their own countries. A good example is King Walagamba who invaded South India and brought back 20,000 prisoners. And there have been occasions where we have occupied foreign territories. Kerala legend says that Sri Lankan kings occupied Kerala. Even Sri Lanka's famous architect, Mr. Ashley was says, the Watadage roof style is still used in Kerala. Now, if we consider the latter stages, these two things, location and treasures, also attracted the maritime and colonial powers. So we were a target. Now, our kings dealt with the same way because what they did was sometimes they reached out to rival powers. A good example is King Rajasinghe II reaching out to the Dutch and having a pact with the Dutch to get rid of the Portuguese. And many of us might not know, King Senarath negotiated and had an understanding with the Kingdom of Denmark in August 1618. A fleet, a very small fleet of uh, ships from Denmark came to open trade links and also to bring armaments. But the subsequent uh, fleet never arrived. And also during this period, I must mention there was Robert Knox who wrote about Sri Lanka. He was a prisoner under King Rajasinghe II for 19 years from 1659 to 1680. And it is said that Daniel Defoe was inspired by Robert Knox when he wrote Robinson Crusoe. So 1815, we became a part of the British Empire. But I must emphasize one thing. We were never fully colonized or fully conquered by, the, by any of the foreign powers. We ceded our independence by an agreement called the Candian Convention. Since then, till we gain independence, our foreign policy was dictated by the foreign policies of Britain. Now let's see post-independence period. When we gained independence in 1948, we had to frame our own foreign policy. This was the background of emerging Cold War rivalry and of course the development requirements that was needed. So we, made, uh, we faced many foreign policy challenges. 
one of the first foreign policy challenges we may face was with regard to the admission to the United Nations. In 1940, the year we gained independence, we applied for membership to the UN. But till 1955, we could not gain admission. The reason, four times Soviet Union vetoed our application. And it is considered to be one of the highest number of vetoes used against an independent state seeking admission to the United Nations. The reason was, or the official reason, that the British basis, as per the UK-Sri Lanka Defence Agreement, was stationed in Sri Lanka. So, our decision makers at that time was quite astute. They used non-admission to the United Nations to our own benefit. I'll tell you how. By 1951, the, there was an armistice talk during the Korean War. And as a result, the hostilities ceased to a great extent. And simultaneously, the prices for our natural rubber plummeted with the other exports. So we turned towards USA. Three things we asked. A $50 million loan and to get rice at reasonable prices. I was also found it surprising because previously we have imported rice from USA and Ecuador, paying a premium. The third thing we have asked was decent prices for rubber exports. Of course, there was no positive reply. So the country was facing a critical situation. On the one hand, we don't have sufficient right to feed the people. And on the other hand, we are not getting sufficient money from our exports. At the same time, China was also having a problem. The problem was they were not getting sufficient quantities of natural rubber to meet their demands. The reason was, as per a UN resolution, Malaya has stopped exporting natural rubber to China. So, then our government initiated discussions with the Chinese government, which resulted in the Ceylon-China Trade Agreement of 1952, commonly known as the Rubber Rice Pact. To understand the context under which we entered into negotiations and signed the agreement, let me quote the then Minister of Trade and Commerce, Mr. R.G. Senanayaka, what he said during the debate in the parliament. I am quoting him in verbatim. We waited for foreign aid, foreign assistance. As you know, sir, over and over again, we made appeals for point four aid. That is the aid under which America gives aid. We waited for four long years. We have got in the form of assistance only a cook for the Kundasale Girls School. Therefore, in these circumstances, it was necessary that we should go where it was possible to get our requirements. So we can understand the context. And the Rubber Rice Pact, which was signed in 52, lasted for 30 odd years, till 1982, and is considered to be one of the most beneficial agreements ever entered into by Sri Lanka. Of course, it had this negative fallout. America invoked the Battle Act, which prevents aid being given to countries that supply strategic items to communist China. And they also stopped exporting sulfur, which is required for our rubber plantations. It had its positive fallouts also, because Sri Lanka was included in the itinerary of US Vice President Richard Nixon's visit to Asia. On 27th November 1953, he came for a 43 and a half hour visit to Sri Lanka. He had discussions with the then Prime Minister, Sir John Kotalawal. If you go to Kandavala Walawa, which, uh, which was the private residence of Sir John, which is under the uh, purview of Kotalawal Defence Ministry, you can see a nice photograph, Sir John and Vice President Nixon seated on a mat, enjoying an evening of entertainment, a real Paduru party. Then, after that, because of the success of the discussions, things were restored and we gained admission to the UN as a part of a package where 16 countries were given admission. 
package between uh, deal between the two superpowers. On 14th December 1955, exactly 65 years ago to date. The interesting thing is the British bases were still in Sri Lanka. Now, there was another similar issue that Sri Lanka had to face. That was in 1962. These are foreign policy challenges. Under the, uh, during the tenure of Mrs. Bandaranaik, America invoked the Hickenloop Amendment. It was a, this particular amendment was a rider to the Foreign Aid Bill or Foreign Assistance Act of 1962. The amendment was introduced so as not to give aid to countries that appropriate US assets. It was targeted mainly Argentina and Cuba. The reason was the Sri Lankan government nationalized British and uh, American oil companies. But Sri Lanka being very critical of US policy in Vietnam also would have contributed to this fact. So how did we manage? Our government of the day negotiated successfully with other major powers, including the socialist bloc, and ensured there were sufficient petroleum products coming into the country, and we got development assistance. Now, since joining the United Nations, we are very actively involved in the workings of the UN. One of the first international crises that came up was the Suez Canal issue. And Prime Minister SWRD Bandarnak at that time issued a statement suggested the need to have immediate discussion among powers closely connected with the issue. One day later, a similar statement issued by President Eisenhower. So our Prime Minister was one day ahead than the US President. Then, during the deliberations, we contributed actively and we also committed forces to the United Nations Emergency Fund, uh, Emergency Force. Similarly, for Congo issue, Hungarian issue where our permanent representative, Mr. RSS Gunavadana, was appointed to the committee looking into the Hungarian problem. Vietnam issue, Seven Day War, so many issues, we actively took part. In the UN, we also spearheaded this resolution to declare Indian notion as a zone of peace and also on law of the sea where Mr. Shirley Amarasegam presided most of the deliberations. Then when it came to trade, we were quite astute. We had a very pragmatic trade policy. We delineated politics from trade. A good example is, while vehemently being opposed to the apartheid policy practiced by South Africa, we continued with permitted trade. And now economic diplomacy is evident because we were founder members of the G77 group and we played a major role in UNCTAD with our own Sri Lankan economist, Dr. Garmin Korea, being the Secretary General from 1974 to 1984. Now, during this period, the biggest problem faced by small countries like Sri Lanka was not to be dragged into the Cold War rivalry. How did we manage that? Successive governments tried to manage it by following a neutral policy, a non-aligned policy but it was not well received. On more than one occasion, US Secretary of State, Foster Dallas, was very critical of countries that followed a non-aligned policy. So we played an active part, or contributed significantly to the development of Afro-Asian solidarity through the Colombo powers, which paved the way for the forming of the non-aligned movement. In the non-aligned movement, we were very active. It gave us and other small countries a refuge, a sanctuary, not to get dragged into the Cold War rivalry. Our neutral foreign policy also well, was well received in many occasions. Some instances I, that comes to my mind is Sri Lanka was able to convene a mini summit to try and resolve the Indochina border war. We manage our relationships very well with India and Pakistan under very difficult circumstances during the East Pakistan war. Then, during the 1971 insurrection, we got military assistance from all major powers from both blocs. So when we consider the foreign policy challenges and the way we have handled it, I would say that for a small country, we were punching way above our weight. Now, 
come into the post cold war period we saw the demise of the cold war in 1990 catalyzed by the glasnost and the perestroika initiated by the soviet union so the world entered an uncharted territory everybody thought from now on it will be a unipolar world but the reality has been somewhat different because there are other power centers emerging like the brics countries so from the envisage unipolar world we are looking at somewhat of a multipolar world short of pure multipolarity this itself brings the set of challenges now let's look at some of the challenges again i will try to for purpose of clarity categorize it into three one is the peaceful periphery ensuring a peaceful periphery the second is having relations with major powers and by extension with international organization economic and political blocks and the third is global issues or issues of the future everybody wants to live in a peaceful environment if you are not happy we try to shift to a better place but a country cannot do that why the geographic location is fixed you have to live with it whether we like it or not india is only 22 miles away whether we like it or not china is in the neighborhood in asia and the biggest transformation in this century is emergence of china as a world economy and india as an economic power it's not a secret they are rivals historically we have had good relations with both countries then we should recalibrate our foreign policy to ensure that we foster relations with both countries without alienating either and also we have to ensure that sri lanka does not become a playground for their rivalry or for that matter anybody's rivalry then that brings to my mind what happened few weeks ago the visiting us secretary of state publicly criticized china and china responded publicly criticizing usa this all happened in sri lanka so has sri lanka become a playground for geopolitical rivalry so now let's look at relations with major powers and by extension other organizations sri lanka is not a military power nor an economic power it will leave alone being a power we don't have the economic leverage nor the military leverage so in a situation like that we have to ensure that we have maintain good relations with the largest possible number of countries in the world but we must remember one thing very clearly this i must emphasize friendship in international relations is not a function of personal goodwill or personal affection that is one mistake our decision makers make it is how relevant we are to others so our foreign policy should be geared to ensure that others have an interest in us and our development as a country when we say we should have good relations with major powers it also means we should not become mouthpieces or proxies to those powers if we do that we might alienate our traditional friends allies and neighbors something that comes to my mind was few years ago sri lanka issued a statement criticizing maldives con- commenting on the internal affairs of maldives at the behest of the then foreign minister now maldives is a traditional friend of sri lanka then let's talk about by extension relations with international organization our relations with major powers also result in what we have to face in international organizations a good example is the resolutions against us in the unhrc the prime mover of the resolution usa called it a cesspit of politics and left the left unhrc then the subsequent revelations by lieutenant colonel gash what he stated and all his dispatches then dispatches sent by uk defense attache which was retrieved with untiring efforts by lord nesby and even wikileaks cables question the very foundation on which the resolution is built 
Still, we are landed with the resolution. We ended up co-sponsoring it. So these are the foreign policy challenges. And uh, that also brings to my mind what Madeleine Albright said, the 60 minute the program on 12th May in 1966. When questioned, her exact words were, even if sanctions against Iraq cause death of half a million Iraq children, the price is worth it. It was called collateral damage. And recently, the ICC was investigating to war crimes by British troops in 2003 to 2008. And ICC head, Chief Prosecutor Fatua Bin Soda says, reasonable basis to believe that atrocities such as willful killing, torture, inhuman or cruel treatment and rape may have been committed by British armed forces. But she's justifying, she's not going ahead with the investigations. Then we are left with the question, whether what is good for the goose is good for the gander is applicable to us. Then let's look at other challenges, the global issues. So we are quite familiar with the uh, China, US trade war, Iran nuclear issue, Brexit, ISIS, Middle East question. We are quite familiar with those issues. So we had to factor that into our foreign policy. But there are many other issues which we didn't even envisage 30, 40 years ago, like food security, water security, energy security, cyber crimes, transnational crimes, then uh, religious extremism, now we are becoming more familiar with it, and unplanned urbanization, climate change, marine pollution, even garbage. Now somebody might like, why garbage? Sri Lanka free trade agreement with Singapore, the main issue was garbage. So we have to factor all that into our foreign policy. Those are challenges. Without factoring those things, we will, in plain language, miss the bus. We have to be very smart. Then, of course, we'll come to year 2020. Everything has turned upside down. As we can see, social distancing, can't see the faces, we have to communicate with the eyes. So, this pandemic has basically question the very essence of globalization. What was basically promoted for decades has taken 180 degree turn overnight. So countries are putting barriers, not allowing people to come into the country. So these are challenges. It leads to foreign policy challenges. Now, when Sri Lanka stopped imports because of the dire financial crisis, mainly because of the COVID pandemic, the EU ambassador and the German ambassador informs the government that we have to import from EU countries. Maybe it's justified, but these are foreign policy challenges. Then, of course, I want to comment about the presidency of Donald Trump. The reason is, I would say it's a very eventful presidency. We saw USA pulling out of the UNHRC, UNESCO, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, uh, then cutting down funds on WHO, UNFP, if I'm not mistaken, and criti criticized the ICC for uh, investigating war crimes by USA, banned ICC chief and investors coming to the country, started a trade war with uh, uh, China, pulled from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and even had summit meetings with the North Korean leader. And the list goes on. Now we are looking at a post Trump era, it will bring another set of challenges. For better or for worse, we'll, only time will tell. So, but anyway, we have to prepare for any eventuality. Then let me comment very briefly on the United Nations. Some say it's good, some say it's bad, some say it's a white elephant, whatever. There are merits and demerits. So I will not want to dwell on that. But let me quote Dr. Victor Andres Belonde, a Peruvian diplomat, when he commented how UN functions. He said, when two small powers have a dispute, the dispute disappears. When a great power and a small power are in conflict, the small power disappears. 
And when two great powers have a dispute, the United Nations disappear. So I let you ponder whether it's still applicable. And also, let me take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to Mr. George Cook for giving me the honor and the pleasure to be a part of these proceedings. I got to know George when he became a colleague of mine in the foreign service. Of course, I knew of him because he was a, quite a flamboyant media personality. But what struck me most was, even as a junior diplomat, he had a lot of substance. He was very articulate, quite soft, and could hold forth in any forum with a seasoned diplomat. Of course, he left the foreign service. I personally see it's a loss for the service. But uh, I think leaving the service has given him the space to do more work to a wider audience and wider stakeholder. So what he has done today, an individual has done what an institution should have done. So I think, I'm, look, I'm personally looking forward to the next edition, next year, and also I'm sure everybody will join when I say, thank you for George, enriching our lives with your academic and substantive work, and we are very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tarpoheva, for those uh, timely words on the challenges faced, foreign policy challenges faced uh, by Sri Lanka over the years. Now, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege this evening to introduce Professor Emeritus Amal Jayawardena, who will review the publication being launched this evening. Professor Emeritus Amal Jayawardena is at present Senior Professor at the Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, Sir John Kotalao Defense University. Previously, he served as the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and the Head of the Department of International Relations, University of Colombo. He was appointed the Executive Director of the Regional Center for Strategic Studies from 2008 to 2011. Since 2013, he has been serving as Sri Lanka government's representative to the ASEAN Regional Forum Experts and Eminent Persons Group. He is a member of the Board of Management of the Bandarnaika Center for International Studies and Regional Center for Strategic Studies. He has also served as visiting professor at the School of International Service, the American University, Washington, DC, and research scholar at the Department of International Relations, London School of Economics and Political Science. He obtained his BA from the University of Ceylon and MA and PhD from the University of Washington. He has also functioned as a consultant to the National Integration Program Unit of the Ministry of Ethnic Affairs and National Integration, member of the Coordinating Committee Center for the Study of Human Rights, University of Colombo, Co-Director, Center of Policy Studies and Research, University of Colombo, Founding Director of the Institute of International Studies, Kandy, Member of the Board of Management of the Lakshman Khadirgam Institute for International Relations and Strategic Studies, and International Center for Ethnic Studies. During the period from 1994 to 1997, he served as a member of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry in respect to involuntary removal and disappearance of persons. It is my honor to invite Professor Emrita Samal Jayavardhana to address this gathering. Thank you. Good evening, Your Excellencies and uh, distinguished guests. Admiral Professor Jayanath Kolambage and Professor Nayani Melogada, Dr. Chanaka Talpeva, and Mr. George Kure, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. And now I have been asked to review George Cook's book. And I have to do this within 15 minutes. 
let me first congratulate Mr. George Cook for having published this scholarly piece of research to mark the 65th anniversary of Sri Lanka's membership in the United Nations. This is only the first volume, and I hope that he will be able to come up with the second volume very soon. Now, as you all know, Sri Lanka gained independence in 1948. For a small country, Sri Lanka's role in international affairs has been very active since the early days of independence. However, Sri Lanka could not become a member of the United Nations till 1955 because Sri Lanka's membership issue got entangled with Cold War politics. Now, George's book has five chapters and the first chapter deals with this period from 1948 to 55. Now, he has included 12 documents in this section and all these documents cannot be found in a single book. Therefore, this is a very important chapter where one could find all the relevant documents to Sri Lanka's admission to the United Nations. Now, the second chapter includes the speeches made by Sri Lankan diplomats during the early period of independence. Now, it is generally alleged that Sri Lanka was handicapped in the management of her external affairs during the early part of the independence due to her inexperience in foreign affairs and also due to the shortage of professional diplomats. However, this weakness did not reflect in Sri Lanka's work in the UN. Sri Lanka's earliest representatives, permanent representatives to the UN, such as Mr. RSS Gunawadana and Sir Claude Correa, demonstrated a very high degree of diplomatic maturity and intellectual sophistication in presenting Sri Lanka's position on global issues. It's a pleasure to read these documents because they are very rich in their contents. Many of the arguments put forward by uh, Sri Lankan representatives, you, even during the first years after Sri Lanka's admission to the United Nations, seem to have a continuing relevance to the problems of the present day. Even at this early stage, they talked about need for reforms in the UN Security Council, the nexus between disarmament and development, and the idea of establishing a special United Nations Fund for Economic Development as a channel to provide underdeveloped countries with much needed uh, funds. It was in this context that Sri Lanka held the establishment of the UN Conference on Trade and Development in 1964 as one of the most important events since the establishment of the United Nations. Later, Dr. Gamini Korea, as the Secretary, of the, uh, Secretary General of UNCTAD, espoused the course of the third world countries. Now, Sri Lanka's delegates uh, were also prominent among UN spokesman in pointing out to the connection between disarmament and development. Sir so Claude Correa, you can find these documents on page 78, he argued in October 1960 that the needs of developing countries could, not, uh, could only be met if we put an end to the arms race and transfer a ma major part of what is so lavishly spent on weapons of mass destruction. Now, Mrs. Bandar Naika demonstrated a very strong position on the issue of nuclear disarmament. Actually, at the Cairo summit, 
1964, she brought forward this idea of nuclear peace, uh, nuclear free zone. Later, uh, Jana, uh, it was Jant Danapala as the director of UNIDIL and also the Under Secretary General for Disarmament Affairs made a significant contribution towards promoting course of disarmament. One could say that this was the golden era of Sri Lanka's profile in UN. Later, Sri Lanka became a sort of a bystander in the UN, especially on the issue of nuclear disarmament. Of course, Jaya, Jaya Vadana proposed the establishment of a disarmament authority and also Sri Lanka's diplomat recently uh, has worked on the issue of disarmament. But here I mention the issue of nuclear uh, disarmament. Now, uh, nuclear weapons ban treaty was approved by 122 nations at the United Nations in July 2017s, but Sri Lanka has not signed or ratified this treaty. A country which advocated nuclear disarmament has not um, signed this treaty or ratified this treaty. Uh, I think this is a bit strange. Now, as you know, the doomsday clock, which was a symbol representing the likelihood of, likelihood of a man-made global catastrophe. In 1947, it was seven minutes to midnight. Seven minutes to midnight. But in 1991, it was 17 minutes to midnight. In January 2018, two minutes to midnight. And in 2020, January, it is 100 seconds to midnight. One minute and 40 seconds. So this is a very crucial era. Uh, therefore, I, I hope uh, Sri Lanka will sign and ratify this treaty. Now, also these documents find many references to Sri Lanka's stand on the issues of South Africa, Rhodesia, Vietnam, and Congo. These early documents which are given in under chapter two and uh, three. Now, before the aggravation of the ethnic problem in the country, Sri Lanka stood on very high moral grounds. In passing judgments on other countries on, issue, uh, on issues of human rights violations, racism and apartheid. When the country became a violent democracy with the aggravation of the ethnic conflict, Sri Lanka found itself at the receiving end of international criticism. In that sense, the documents included in the uh, present volume uh, is representative of that golden era when Sri Lanka stood on very high moral grounds on human rights issues. And uh, as you know, now there are uh, resolutions against Sri Lanka. Uh, I am sure when uh, George Cook presents his second volume, uh, it will have different set of documents. Now the United Nations provided a global forum for a small country like Sri Lanka to maintain a high profile in world affairs. In December 1971, as you know, Mrs. Bandar Nayaka presented the Indian Ocean Peace Zone proposal. And of course, now the present government has mentioned that uh, Sri Lanka's priority is to uh, maintain the Indian Ocean as a uh, neutral zone. So I'm happy that that idea has now revived. Uh, because at that time, Mrs. Bandar Nayaka said, our objective is to contain 
the activities of foreign powers and ensure that they do not make our part of the world a battleground for their rivalries. It is on page 227 in this document. Uh, now I think that that idea still has a continuing relevance. Now it was a happy coincidence that when she addressed the UN in 1976 in her capacity as the chairperson of the non-aligned movement, the General Assembly was presided over by Mr. Shirley Amarsinghe, Sri Lanka's permanent representative to the United Nations. And he happily said, it is a unique honor and privilege for a president of the assembly to welcome his own head of government to the assembly for such an important purpose and on such a special occasion. It's on page 289. It is interesting to note how Shirley Amarsinghe was elected as the president of the 31st session of the General Assembly. Uh, you can see page 280. There, Shirley Amarsinghe was elected as the president to the 31st Assembly out of 138 votes. Shirley Amarsinghe obtained 135 and other three candidates obtaining only one each. 135, of course, Shirley Amarsinghe, uh, in his uh, you know, introduction, he said, uh, with all humility, I should say that this is not a reflection of my personal popularity, but the image of the country. Because at that time, Sri Lanka was the chairman of the non-aligned movement, and uh, Shirley Amarasingh, of course, he was a popular person and later he became the chairman of the Law of the Sea Conference. Now, when you review a book, of course, you have to mm, talk about merits as well as uh, demerits. And uh, I can see that many, you know, I mean, uh, shortcomings, but only one uh, shortcoming, not a shortcoming, a question, um, what is the, uh, you know, chronological demarcation, this 148 to 1982, uh, what is that end point? I thought that either it should have uh, ended, uh, ended in 2000, uh, in 1977, that is the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the advent of Jaya Jayawardena regimes, or it should have continued till 1988, the end of Jaya Jayawardena's regime. Uh, therefore, maybe uh, George has his own uh, rationale. Even with these minor shortcomings, I think George has engaged in a very painstaking exercise and he has uh, he has come out with flying colors. And I know personally the pains of collecting and editing documents since I have myself undergone this arduous task. When I produced the book on documents on Sri Lanka's foreign policy, I had the benefit of a project initiated by Professor Shelton Kodikar and K.P. Misra of India. However, George had to do all by himself. I hope George will continue this work because Sri Lanka is far behind in this task. Uh, task. For example, there is a large number of documentary collection on Indian foreign policy. And on Indo-Sri Lanka relations alone, uh, this Avtar Singh Bashin has produced five volumes, and on other areas also, in, in, on Indian foreign policy, you have a large number of collections of documents. As uh, Dr. Chanaka Talpeheva rightly said, these things have to be done by institutions. But unfortunately, uh, that is not there. Uh, I think rather than collecting facts from secondary works, one should always try to read 
original documents. Learning history through documents, I think that's a habit we should encourage students to learn. When we were undergraduates at the Peradeniya University, uh, actually after the first year, then three, you know, special degrees, three years, and we didn't have exams in the third year or the four, uh, in the second year or in the third year or the, uh, at the end of the fourth year, we have nine papers and that's a final examination. And one paper included excerpts from documents. We have to read all the documents and in the examinations you are given excerpts you have to comment on. I remember Professor Shelton Kodikara who taught us constitutional history of India. He gives chunks and chunks of material from Indian constitutions and uh, we have to comment and we have to study. Now, mm, that is really learning history through documents. Let me give you an example from George's book, how BCI is being a teaching institute, how they can encourage students to uh, learn through documents. Now, generally we think that uh, Sri Lanka's application was vetoed by the USSR. But in the documents you find that it was not only the USSR, but the Ukrainian SSR, Ukrainian Republic. Then what would, why, uh, then one would wonder how come Ukraine was a Soviet Republic? Was it an independent country? When you inquire about this thing, you will find that Ukraine was a founder member of the United Nations. Founder member of the United Nations. How come? Because when the establishment of the United Nations was discussed in 1944, the Soviet Union demanded that all the 15 republics should be given a separate seat. Then, uh, uh, then the USA and Britain said, uh, no, uh, you are not independent countries. But then the Soviet Union pointed out, how come India is, is still a colony? Now, now this is 1944. India is still a colony. Philippines. Uh, Philippines was in a transitional period, but uh, uh, Philippines uh, foreign policy was conducted by the US. Uh, there were contradictions like that. Finally, Britain and US agreed to give two seats, Ukraine and Belarusia. So now uh, Ukraine and Belarusia are founder members of the UN and India uh, signed the Declaration of the United Nations in 1944 before becoming uh, an independent country. So you will also realize that uh, it was not really the Soviet Union opposed Sri Lanka's membership. That's a secondary matter because this, this issue got uh, held up by this Cold War politics. Uh, therefore, that is why I, I mentioned that the importance of these documents. When you read documents like uh, student of languages, uh, you know, they are supposed to uh, read uh, novels and short stories. Like that, even history and I are undergraduates, they should be taught to read documents rather than collecting facts from secondary uh, works. So in that sense, I think uh, George should uh, continue this work. He has already written a collection of documents that is Anura uh, Bandaranayaka Legacy in the Legislature 1977 to 2008. So it's a, it's a collection of uh, his speeches and um, his speeches. Uh, like that uh, George has started this uh, uh, practice of collecting documents and publishing them, I think uh, these things should have been done, should be done through institutions. In India, there are institutional mechanisms to do that, but unfortunately, since we don't have it in this country, uh, people like uh, George should be congratulated for doing this work. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Doctor, for that uh, concise yet comprehensive uh, analysis of the book, which is to be launched today. The Swiss national Cardinal Mermillon famously stated that the role of a mother cannot be replaced by anyone and that a mother can play the role of everyone else. Therefore, to launch, to issue the first copy of this book, may I kindly invite Mrs. Yvette Cook. Next, may I kindly invite the Foreign Secretary of Sri Lanka, Admiral Professor Jayanath Kolamage. <laughs> Senior Professor Naini Melagoda. Professor Emeritus Amal Jayavardhana. And Dr. Chanaka Talpaheva. Now may I kindly invite Kumud Munasinghe to read the special message. Special message from Her Excellency Mrs. Catalin Anna Maria Bogge, Permanent Representative of Hungary to the United Nations, Chairperson of the Committee of Social, Humanitarian and Cultural Issues Third Committee for the 75th session of the General Assembly. I quote, 75 years ago, when the battlefields of the Second World War were silent, but its horrors reverberated around the globe, a new world order slowly emerged out of the smoldering remains of the old one. Its manifestation was the Charter of the United Nations developed by 50 nations at the San Francisco Conference. These 50 nations, along with Poland as the 51st, became the founders of the United Nations in 1945. Joining the United Nations was of particular significance, especially for the newly independent states. Some more countries were able to join the UN in the next few years, but in 1950, the Cold War power games derailed this process. In 1951, 18 more countries were awaiting admission, waiting for a political bargain between the Soviet Union and the United States of America. 16 of those countries, including Hungary and Sri Lanka, at the time Ceylon, were finally approved as members in 1955, long after their application, Hungary in 1947, and Sri Lanka, Ceylon, in 1948. Hungary and Sri Lanka, two countries with rich and diverse history, became part of the UN family on the same day, 14th December 1955. And for both countries, it was a great achievement, although their circumstances were quite different. Sri Lanka had been on the road of gaining full independence from colonial rule, while Hungary's independence existed only on paper as the country was under Soviet occupation. In the following years, these countries were able to gradually get involved in the activities of the UN family and have since been represented in the organization by national experts and officials who assist the work of the UN Secretariat, UN bodies, specialized institutions and autonomous bodies, as well as other committees and related bodies. While it did not change the outcome of the struggle, nevertheless, its membership in the United Nations proved to be highly important for Hungary just one year later, at the outbreak of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. 
Although the Security Council was paralyzed on the issue, the General Assembly took the lead, and the UN Special Committee on the Problem of Hungary was established, and the case and fate of the Hungarian Revolution stayed on its agenda long after the revolution was defeated. Hungarian people received great support from Ceylon during this period, as Ceylon, being a member of this committee, was responsible for two different reports on the status of Hungary under communist dictatorship. This story is also proof that membership in the United Nations means visibility for small nations and can make a difference in desperate times. The UN should be a table where every state can sit down, a forum where everyone is heard, and everyone is equally important. This is the concept of multilateralism, and this is a major political principle of diplomacy I always believed in and acted upon as the 36th president of the UNESCO General Conference, or right now, as the chair of the third committee on social, humanitarian, and cultural issues in the 75th General Assembly of the United Nations, and as the permanent delegate to UNESCO or permanent representative of Hungary to the UN. Multilateral diplomacy is similar to gardening. As American economist and member of the Reagan administration, George Schultz put it, you plant, you wait, you sow the seeds, you wait, you trim and harvest at some point. In multilateralism, you talk to people, you develop a relationship of trust and confidence, and if something comes up, you have a base to work from. You need patience with international institutions as gardening takes time. The UN is for planting, seeding, trimming for the long run, rather than bargaining quick business deals. Assertive communication, searching for common values and understanding the cultural background of our partners open new windows for peace and development. In cultural diplomacy, using visual art forms, music and performing arts, sports events and spiritual gatherings build bridges between people, nations, cultures and civilizations. And if we share our common experience, we can celebrate the beauty of our cultural diversity together. While being a television broadcaster prior to my diplomatic career, I had the pleasure and the honor to make a documentary about the culture of Sri Lanka for Hungarian television in the beginning of the 90s. This was a first as many of our television viewers had no previous knowledge of Sri Lanka or the region. I arrived in a country rich in history, art, music and nature. I visited World Heritage Sites such as Dambulla, Kandy, Sigiriya and Polonnaruwa, places that left me speechless, and met Buddhism, a religion and philosophy that shares my faith in soft solutions, tolerance and dialogue. During my presidency of the UNESCO General Conference, I was always aware that I had a great ally in Sri Lanka. We worked together closely on interfaith and intercultural dialogue that resulted in the Interfaith Dialogue Conference in Sri Lanka and the Vesak Day celebrations in Paris. Intercultural and interfaith dialogue and mutual respect are the very center of my approach to human relations, and I was always deeply grateful to have Sri Lanka on my side in this work. Societies have deep reserves of inner knowledge, culture, and religion. These values, nurtured and embraced, can be the foundation for the culture of peace. I saw this happen in Sri Lanka, where interfaith dialogue had, a, had such a great effect on reconciliation. There's still a lot of suspicion regarding religious organizations showing interest in international diplomacy, but those organizations are worthy of attention and trust. They can reach communities, shape opinions, and work on grassroots problems like no one else can. Moderate religious leaders of the world can help construct a fair and sustainable society. Without interfaith and intercultural dialogue, there is no culture of peace, no tolerance, mutual respect, understanding, or harmony. A truce can stop violence, but it can't provide sustainable peace. Peace needs a round table and people who are ready to sit down with each other and engage. When I write these lines, the world faces a new kind of enemy. 
The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are dramatic on the world's health systems, economy, food chains, schools, personal relations, and mental health. We cannot negotiate with the virus, but we still have the imperative to negotiate with each other. We are bound to help, support, share the burden and resources. We can only hope that we share the lessons learned too. We are interconnected, we are interdependent. We need to find ways to get along, to lift each other up, to understand concerns and fears that surface from angles that are different from our viewpoints. We need to be inclusive in our thinking, in our communication, and in our actions. Multilateralism is a tool for diplomacy to rise above such challenges. Conflicts, disasters, and crises won't stop at any border. This interdependence of states and governments directs diplomacy towards forms of equal cooperation. Multilateralism is not without flaws and is severely criticized in both the institutional and theoretical levels. However, multilateralism provides a framework for structural cooperation that has no alternative in our modern world. This is the mission of the United Nations. This is the sole purpose for which it was established 75 years ago. This is why Sri Lanka, Hungary, and all the nations applied for membership to participate, to be visible, to be heard, to add our own flavors, perspectives, history, and knowledge to the mix, and grow from the common work, discussions, and disputes. I had the honor to congratulate the United Nations on its 75th anniversary in the General Assembly Hall this fall in New York. And now, I congratulate Sri Lanka on its 65th anniversary as a member of the same United Nations with all the warmth of my heart. Our countries stepped on the road to multil multilateralism on the same day, and we have walked together ever since. Let's continue that journey long together in mutual acceptance and respect, Sri Lanka, Hungary, in the UN and beyond. And lastly, I congratulate my dear friend and colleague, George Cook, for publishing this book on Sri Lanka's history within the UN. Her Excellency, Mrs. Catalin Anna Maria Bogier, permanent representative of Hungary to the United Nations, chairperson of the Committee of Social, Humanitarian and Cultural Issues Third Committee for the 75th session of the General Assembly, December 2020, New York, United States of America, unquote. Video message from Professor Sharad Soni, Chairperson, Center for Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, India. I am Sharad Soni, a professor at the School of International Studies and Director of International Collaboration at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. I would like to congratulate my dear friend George Cook for publishing his book entitled Sri Lanka and the United Nations Relations in the UN General Assembly, Volume 1, covering the period from 1948 to 1982. It is certainly fantastic news and I am so overwhelmed to know this. As I understand, this book is the first of its kind. As the editor of the book, he has collected all the speeches made by Sri Lanka in the UN General Assembly, besides including the documents pertaining to Sri Lanka's application, the repeated vetoes, and then final membership in 1955. There is also a narrative that runs through the book, connecting the speeches and the different periods from 1948 to date. I came to know that the research behind this book actually started back in 2005 when George was doing his postgraduate diploma in international relations, focusing on the 50th anniversary of the United Nations and Sri Lankans who had been a part of that journey. The timing of the launch of the book is relevant as this year is the 65th anniversary of Sri Lanka's membership to the UN, the 75th anniversary of the UN and a century of multilateralism since the inauguration of the League of Nations in 1920. I am sure this book would be useful for researchers on Sri Lanka's relations with the United Nations, 
plus those interested in multilateralism and how an island nation had used the multilateral fora for its own foreign policy. I am keen to see the second volume of the book covering the period from 1983 to 2020 which he is hoping to bring out in the first half of 2021. Congratulations once again George for your well deserved success and all the best for your future endeavors. Thank you. Video message from Viral Curie Lacoy, diplomat at UNESCO, member of the Independent Panel of Advisors for the Reform of the UN, and professor at the Sciences Po and Sorbonne Universities. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to be with you today for the launch of George Cook's publication, celebrating 65 years of intense relationships between Sri Lanka and the UN General Assembly. Multilateralism is very challenging and complicated. However, it is irreplaceable. And the United Nations, despite the rising criticism, justified criticism in many cases, the United Nations remains, however, the best forum for multilateral negotiations. The UN today is a replica of the divisions of the world. The UN is its member states. So the failures are also our responsibility. We all share a responsibility in what is happening today and in the limitations uh, in the achievements of the United Nations. I teach the UN at Sciences Po, Paris, and at the Sorbonne. And I tell my students the truth. I tell them about the uh, corruption, about the manipulation, about the political pressure, about uh, uh, the skewed recruitment. But I also tell them that the UN is wonderful and irreplaceable and that it has achieved a lot. It has helped a lot in terms of humanitarian uh, work, uh, in terms of development, and its work is far from being done. I tell them that the UN needs them. Excellencies, the UN needs the new generation. I think we've shown what we can do and how far we can get. I think it's time to push the youth the new generation, I think it's time we push people with integrity, with courage, with skills, with competences. I think it's time we push people like you, George. The UN needs you. Thank you for your attention. Video message from Dr. Titipur Pakdivanich, Dean of the Faculty of Political Science, Urban Rachatani University, Thailand. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored to speak at the launch of the book by Josh Cook entitled Sri Lanka and the United Nations Religions in the UN General Assembly. Josh was at my university in the northeastern part of Thailand, Uban Rajatani University, as a research fellow. When he was here, he has shown a particular interest in the contribution of history towards international relations and how countries form their relations uh, with Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka and in the Western world. So when it comes to this book, he edited about the relations between Sri Lanka and the United Nations. I think this is a, um, an, an important piece for us to look at because it contains speeches made by Sri Lanka in the UNGA from 1955 and try to connect with the period so speeches from 1948 as well mostly are speeches delivered by Sri Lanka. And when we look at this kind of uh, historical pieces, it can provide you the information that 
help you or us to understand the nature of the country or the leader and their world views, obviously the world, through speeches that they deliver. And that can help us to understand the relations between Sri Lanka and the United Nations. So I think this book will not only benefit those who are particularly interested in the relations between Sri Lanka and the United Nations, but it will also benefit those who are interested in international relations in general. So I would think that this is very important for us to look at and understand it and it's, it would be very helpful for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nabila. Excellencies, respected invitees, ladies and gentlemen, this evening's proceedings draw to a close. On behalf of the editor of the publication, we thank our honored invitees on stage and all guests this evening for gracing this book launch. The book is available outside this auditorium. We invite you for a coffee and cake in the foyer. Thank you very much and have a safe journey.